I wanted to recount a story that I've actually ate to tell uh, from the moment it happened. Nobody would really listen at the time uh, because, of course, they all had their new and improved and modern and all that surrounding them. It was 1994, the year Mom passed, and it was a blizzard. I mean, a, a horrific blizzard. And after Mom had passed, I was by myself in our big old rambling home that everyone always made fun of. It was Warcut Brick, built in 1921. We had what everyone was laughing about, the old quote-unquote dinosaur of a furnace. But while everyone around me in their modern all-electric homes were freezing because the electricity went out, and lo and behold, they couldn't cook either. And guess what? Their new and improved and modern homes, the roofs were collapsing. And there I was, all comfy and cozy, in the built in 1921 Warcup brick dinosaur. And I went downstairs because dad had taught me of course you could turn the furnace on manually so i went down to the basement turned the furnace on and there we were me and my animal companions toasty warm and guess what we had gas cooking they had electricity but hey you know we still had light with the hurricane lamps and all that so we had gas cooking so I could cook a warm meal, modern and new and improved, is it always progress? This is Monster Chick, and you're watching History and Headlines with Action Gal. So for today's History and Headlines, I decided to talk about something that was a headline almost a decade ago, but uh, not a lot of people know. And if they do, <laughs> you know, maybe they were uneasy about it at the time. But for about two decades, 10% of the United States' power actually came from decommissioned Russian warheads. <laughs> yeah, here's a remarkable fact. For the past two decades, well, keep in mind that this article was written in 2013, um, for the past two decades, 10% of all electricity consumed in the United States has come from Russian nuclear warheads. It was all part of a deal struck at the end of the Cold War. That deal wraps up today, which is uh, December the 11th, 2013. Where was I? <laughs> that deal wraps up today, when the final shipment of fuel arrives at a U.S. facility. The origins of the plan lie in the early 1990s. At the time, Philip Sewell was working for the U.S. Department of Energy. The Soviet Union had just disintegrated, and Sewell's job was to find a way to collaborate with the former adversaries. In practice, this involved driving out into the Russian countryside to military facilities that weren't even on the map. When Sewell got there, what he saw wasn't pretty. Windows were broken, gates were not locked, and there were very few people around, Sewell says. But inside these crumbling buildings, the Russian government stored the uranium from thousands of decommissioned nuclear weapons. It seemed like particularly anyone could walk off with such stuff for a bomb. Sewell and his colleagues wanted to get rid of all this uranium, so they decided to try to persuade the Russians to sell their surplus to the U.S. After all, the stuff was just lying around. H and H with Action Gal. This is Pet Monster, and thanks for watching. Okay, and thank you, Action Gal, and the team, of course, with her history and headlines project. Gosh, I just love you all. Okay, so 
she wanted me to look into alternative fuels. You're going to want to stick around. So there's one of them called ethanol, and that is just one of the corniest things, you know, <laughs> see what I did there? But it's a growing renewable fuel, and it's several alternative fuels, and it's also part of the internal combustion engine, and including a compressed gas, propane, and alcohol, such as methanol and ethanol. Ethanol, or ethyl alcohol, was mm, practically a renewable and not form of petroleum gasoline substitute, and millions of flex fuel vehicles, which run on either E85 gasoline or the uh, other gasolines that are made out of corn and base, are actually some cars that are already currently on the road. Huh. You know, I remember as a kid, people saying, oh, put some ethyl in your tank. I never understood who she was. I'm glad I did this. Now, another uh, form of alternative fuel is something called biodiesel. Now, before you link this with Vin Diesel's anatomy and girls, who could blame you? It's not why maybe what you think. Another renewable fuel of attention is biodiesel, a fuel made of vegetable oil. Okay, so you've got ethyl in the kitchen, and now you've got vegetable oil in the kitchen. This is going to be fun driving in the future. So vegetable oil is for diesel engines, and in our tests, a car running on vegetable oil, it's about the same acceleration, and of course, I want to thank consumerreports.org for telling me that that you know yeah and one of the things that I read in this article that I found very interesting is they're looking into the possibility of using recycled vegetable oil at some time okay which is interesting during this pandemic considering how many people are getting their food through Grubhub so I guess what you deliver the food then go back to where you got the fries from and put it in your tank sure i can dig it although it may affect how i tip you just saying and then of course the last fuel that i want to talk about is something called hydrogen fuel cars and there's been a lot of buzz about it and people are can just can't wait just can't wait but it's going to be off in the distance and hydrogen is a highly more energetic form of gasoline, if you will, and EV batteries, not to mention you can literally overstate drink from the exhaust. They, it is the, going to be the cleanest alternative, but it is off in the future. It's kind of water-based and hydrogen monoxide and so on and so forth. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a chemist. I'm just a person that likes to read you should too. So if you're interested in alternative fuels and what the future may hold for you, because believe me, them low gas prices, they're not going to stay around forever. <laughs> so if you're interested, yeah, look it up. But the hydrogen fuel stuff, it's a long ways off. Okay. And the tests that are being done currently in Sweden where they want to absolutely make auto emissions a thing in the past, we may actually see that first car from the country that never really got involved with much. Hats off to you there, Sweden brothers and sisters. I salute you. I am your ever faithful granny monster for history and headlines with Action Gal. Drive safe. That is the employee entrance at Walmart in the new normal. And they go through there and they get their temperature and all that checked before they're allowed to go to work. History, History and, and headlines, headlines with, with Action, Action Gal. Gal.